Good morning, everybody. So today is Tuesday and we are on day 22 of module three in Wit and Wisdom. And um, I had a meeting this morning that I forgot about. That's why all my hybrid kiddos are gonna be watching this video today too. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen so we can get started on our video lesson for today. Okay, here we go. Welcome back, powerful thinkers. I'm Sue Sabelli, your great minds teacher. Let's see what we need for today. Today we'll need handout 23A, the narrative writing checklist, your journal and a pencil. Please pause here to grab what you need and just hit play when you're ready to continue. Okay, so you do not need handout 23A because we are not going to be doing that part of the lesson, all right? So you just need your journal and a pencil. Today, we're going to be wrapping up our study of the story of Ruby Bridges. And as we do, we're going to explore using something called an afterword in order to discover what happened after this book finished. Also, we're going to take some time to reflect on what you know and what you can do now. And also, we'll take some time to look back on focusing question task four with the narrative checklist, so you have a chance to revise as needed. Let's get started. Please pause here to read the essential question to yourself and just hit play when you're ready to continue. Okay, so the essential question is, how can people respond to injustice? Remember, that's our big question for module three. The first time that you saw this focusing question, you might have thought to yourself, wow, this is a really hard question. I'm not sure how to answer it. Chances are this question is now very easy for you to answer because you worked hard, you read closely, you used that powerful thinking that you have, and you also pulled your thoughts together in a narrative piece of writing that responded to this question. You did it. There's so much now that you know and that you can do. As we explore the afterword together, this question will guide our thinking. Let's Coral read this question. Ready? Here we go. How does this text build my knowledge of how people respond to injustice? Ruby Bridges is a civil rights hero, and by reading the afterword, we can learn more about what she's doing now after her story, what she's doing now as an adult. And the afterword comes at the end of a story at the back of a book. This is the very last section of the book, the afterword, and they've also included a picture of Ruby. As I read the afterword, I'd like you to keep two questions in mind. Why did two white boys come back to school with Ruby? And also, what is Ruby Bridges doing now as an adult? Keep those questions in mind as you listen. If you'd like to read the afterword on your own and think about these two questions on your own, Feel free to pause the video here to do that now. If you'd like to continue with me, here we go. Later that year, two white boys joined Ruby at the France Elementary School. Their parents were tired of seeing the boys get into mischief around the house when they could have been in school and learning. The mob became very angry when the first white boys went back to school but those boys were soon joined by other children. 
We've been sitting back and letting our children get cheated out of an education because some people have tried to take the law into their own hands, one parent said. It's time for us to fight for the side of the law and for our children's right to go to a school and get their education. They all did get their education. Ruby and a growing number of boys and girls who went to school with her. By the time Ruby was in the second grade, the mobs had given up their struggle to scare Ruby and defeat the federal judge's order that New Orleans schools be desegregated so that children of all races might be in the same classroom. Year after year, Ruby went to the France school. She graduated from it then went on to graduate from high school. Ruby Bridges is married to a building contractor and has four sons who attend school within the New Orleans public school system. Now a successful businesswoman, she has created the Ruby Bridges Educational Foundation for the purpose of increasing parental involvement in schools. For further information about the foundation, write to the following address. The Ruby Bridges Foundation, P.O. Box 127, Winneka, Illinois, 60093. Please pause here to think about these two questions yourself or to chat about this with a learning partner. If you'd like to capture any ideas in your journal to share with your classroom teacher or your classmates, Feel free to do that now too. Just hit play when you're ready to continue. Okay, so let's talk about the answers to these two questions. It said, why did two white boys come back to school? And if we look in the passage, it said, their parents were tired of seeing the boys get into mischief around the house when they could have been in school and learning. And the second question is, what is Ruby Bridges doing now as an adult? So now as an adult, it says that she's married to a building contractor. She has four sons. She's a successful businesswoman and she created the Ruby Bridges Educational Foundation. That's what she's doing as an adult. And I actually have something that I want to show you. Um, I need to stop sharing my screen for just a second. Okay, so this is an interview with Ruby Bridges as an adult. This says 50 years ago on November 15th, 1960, then six-year-old Ruby Bridges became the first African-American student to attend William Franz Elementary School in New Orleans, Louisiana. Kid reporter Abigail Lista talked to Ms. Bridges about her experience in the civil rights movement. The interview took place at the Ruby Bridges Foundation in New Orleans, Louisiana on October 21st, 2010. So this interview is a little over 10 years old. So let's take a listen. How do you feel when your parents told you they're going to send you to an all white school? Um, actually, my parents didn't tell me that. Uh, the only thing that my parents said to me about attending a different school is that I was going to be going to a new school and that I should behave myself. You must have been afraid as you walked, walked to school through a mob of angry people shouting at you. Were you aware of the danger? How did you overcome your fear? I was never really afraid because I wasn't um, quite sure what was going on at the time. It seemed like Mardi Gras because in New Orleans I'm accustomed to Mardi Gras. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't afraid um, for a very long time. What was it like to be the only African-American child in the all-white school? What I do remember about um, first grade in that year is that it was very lonely. I didn't have any friends and I wasn't allowed to go to the cafeteria or play on the playground. So 
what bothered me the most was the loneliness in, um, in school every day. How did your first grade teacher, Miss Henry, touch your life? Mrs. Henry had a huge impact on my life. Mrs. Henry became my best friend, so she wasn't just my teacher. She was um, my only friend in school. The mere fact that I didn't have other kids to play with, it was just her and I, and she made school fun, so um, she really made a huge impression on me. When you visit schools today, what strikes you most about how different it is from when you were a kid? Um, what strikes me the most? That particular year, as I said, I was alone, so it was totally different for me the second year because then school kids were together in school, and the mere fact that they were both black and white together was totally different from what I had been accustomed to. Today, I do see schools that are uh, diverse and mixed, and I, I think that that's the way schools should be. I don't think that um, racism has a place in the hearts and minds of our children, and um, so I think that all schools should be diverse. That's totally um, not the case across the country. I do have opportunities to visit schools that are still somewhat segregated, and I think that's unfortunate. What impact do you feel you had on desegregation of schools? Uh, truly, it changed the face of education in our country because up until, you know, that, that day when I entered school, the laws kept us segregated. And after entering the school, um, every child has the opportunity to kind of choose their own schools. And children have the opportunity to be with people that look different which would allow them opportunities to make friends with people that are different. Um, so, yes, I think that I had a huge impact on education. Do you know, did you know at the time just how much of a role you're playing in history? Not at all. Um, I was only going to school. I didn't realize that I was making history and, and how important it would be for years to come. So um, I'm extremely proud of the fact that my parents had the courage enough to say yes and to go through that um, that whole year, especially because it has made such a difference in the way that we're taught. It's been 50 years now. When you look back, how do you feel about it all? What emotions come up? Um, I still think there's so much work to be done. Uh, the mere fact that we have an African-American president, we've uh, come a long ways from that day. But um, still racism is alive and well in our country, which is really unfortunate for, for all of us, but especially for our young people, because I think that racism is something that is passed on and taught to our kids. And that's a shame, because I don't think that it really matters to kids early on when they're as young as I was, six years old. Um, it doesn't matter to them what their friends look like. And so it's a shame that we as adults, that we pass it on to our kids. Um, so my work is still out there trying to make a difference and uh, convince kids that, you know, you need to allow yourself the opportunity to get to know one another. What you did affected every person in this country. What kind of impact has the whole experience had on your life personally? I think it shaped me into um, a person that isn't prejudiced. It's um, inspired me to want to continue to make a difference um, in this country. I think that racism is um, ugly and so unfair. Mm -hmm. um, and I believe that, you know, we all need one another. You and I, you know, we'll never know if we meet again, um, if we'll need one another. Maybe I'm someplace and I need help or you may need help. It would be great to know that you would come to my rescue. And I think um, that has nothing to do with what we look like. It has everything to do with what we're like inside, whether or not you'll choose to help me. And uh, that is a message that I want to continue to pass on to kids. What do you hope students of today learn from your experience of 50 years ago? I hope that they take heed to my message, you know, understand um, 
my story and what I went through and why. Um, I think once they understand that and relate it to their own lives, that um, hopefully it will help us to move closer to one another and rid our country of racism. Okay, so there we have an interview with Ruby Bridges as an adult, which kind of goes back to what we just read in the afterword about Ruby Bridges as an adult. So what I want you to do now is turn to page 149 in your journal. We are going to set up a what I know and what I can do chart. On page 149, we need to put today's date on the top, which is 3-2. We need to do what I know, what I can do. Maybe not that bright, right? Okay, and what I want you to think about is think about the past several, like the past week or so, what are some things that you now know about the world and about Ruby Bridges? Oops, hold on. I flipped my camera somehow. Okay, so what are some things that you know about that. What are some things that you can do now as a reader or a writer? So I want you to pause the video, take a few minutes and think of some things that you now know and some things that you can now do as a reader or a writer and then push play when you are ready to continue. So something that I that I now know from reading the story of Ruby Bridges is that when Ruby walked in to the school building, she was very calm and brave. So I'm going to write Ruby was calm and brave. when she walked into the white school every day. And something else that I now know is that sometimes in a story or in a text that different characters have different points of view. So I'm going to write that different characters in a book can have different points of view. All right, and something that I can now do as a reader is I can look at those different points of view in a character's in a, in a text. So I can look at the different points of view. characters in a text. All right. And also something else we've really been working on is I can explode a moment to include more detail. my narrative or my story writing. Okay, so what you are gonna do, I want you to make sure that you have two things that you now know and try to have two things that you can do 
as a reader or a writer. And then what you're going to do is you're going to take a picture of that and you're going to upload it into the Google slide. But we are almost done with our video. I'm going to go ahead and go back. So I've done this when skipping that part. Okay, here we go. As a young child, as a first grader, Ruby Bridges was faced with injustice every single day that she went to school. She responded to that injustice in a very positive way, the best way that she knew how. Ruby had a positive impact on history as a child, and she continues to do that now as an adult. You can make a difference too, not only in your own life, but in your community, especially as you grow older choose to make a positive difference. I will see you again soon, my friends. Okay, so that is the end of the video lesson. Oops, stop here. What you're gonna do today is you're gonna make sure that you finish page 149 in your journal. You're gonna take a picture of it and upload it for me into the Google slide. And you also have a question set to take today, okay? So make sure you get that done. You will have a vocabulary quiz due or sometime this week on the two Ruby Bridges books. So um, I'll, be, I'll let you know when that's gonna happen. I'm gonna try to have it for you tomorrow, but I can't promise. I'm not sorry, tomorrow, today. Um, I can't promise that I'll get that for you, but it will be this week. So be studying those vocabulary words. And um, that's it guys. And I will see you later for phonics. Bye.